Welcome to First First Baptist Church. Glad that you're here this morning. Uh, There's not a whole lot of announcements in the bulletin. I did was reminded, if you're a deacon, uh, set your alarm, okay, so you can wake up after your nap this afternoon and you can come to our meeting at 4 o'clock. In the bulletin, and this is also for you out on Facebook or on the Internet, we have a um, monthly newsletter we send out called The Challenger, and we normally do that, or we mainly do that online. So if you want to be get that as an email, uh, let us know. If you, want, if you have to have it printed, you can let us know also. But uh, if you're here, fill out the back of your bulletin and drop it in the offering plate as you leave, and we'll add you to the uh, challenger list. If you're out there in the airwaves and you want it, you can probably just go to our website and send us a contact information. There's a place on there you can let us know. I don't know if you stick it on Facebook during the service, if you will actually, we'll see it or not. Uh, Glad you're here this morning. Beautiful day outside. (laughs) Glad you blew in and you didn't blow away. Okay, If you are small and you're worried about getting to your car afterwards, let me know and you can, I'll help weight you down. Okay? All right. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for today. Um, Father, just the opportunity to join our hearts and our, our lives together in worship. Lord, I just pray you pour out your blessings on us this morning. For its name in Jesus we pray. Amen. Please stand. Casting my cares aside, I'm leaving my cast behind. I'm setting my heart and mind on you. I'm reaching my hands to yours, believing there's so much more, knowing that all you have in store for me is good. It's good. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day. You have made, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and I won't worry about tomorrow, trusting in what you say, today is the day, today is the day, I'm putting my fears aside, I'm leaving my doubts behind. Giving my hopes and dreams to you, to Jesus. I'm reaching my hands to yours, believing there's so much more. Knowing that all you have in store for me is good. It's good, today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Day. 
made, you have made, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and I won't worry about tomorrow, I'm giving you my fears and sorrow, when you lead me, I will follow, I'm trusting in what you Forgot to turn on my microphone. I have five different things like this. Oh, no. I'm all twisted up. <laughs> Not when it's hanging up. What is this? It's a gong, but it hangs outside, and you see that thing on the bottom? When the wind blows, it hits it. And so Saturday morning, really early in the morning, I kept hearing dong, 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 dong. Why? Because the wind's blowing like crazy outside. Um, so I have one like that. I have a couple that have little pipes on it. This one here I really like, but it's not very loud. Ah. What's going on in there? It's kind of like a, uh, what kind of bell? It's a bell. But see that? And it does, it's not very loud, but it lets me know it's cute. I think it's cute, okay? So when the wind's blowing, you can hear that real high pitch thing on there. I am so frustrated this morning. My grandkids are coming in a couple of weeks. You know what they like to do at Thanksgiving time? No, nope. something else. They like to play in the leaves in the backyard. You know what's weird? I went out there this morning to look, see how many there are. There's like none. They're all in the front yard. They actually blew over the house into the front yard. So I'm like, do I put them in a bag and take them back to the backyard so they'll have the, I don't know. Patty says wait until after today because it's supposed to be uh, supposed to be bad. But um, my wind chimes, I like them. We have some little spinny things in my backyard. If you're ever in my backyard, you can see those. Um, so we, we do have some enjoyment out of the wind that we get, but uh, sometimes it's just nasty outside, and right now it's blowing really hard out there. But I was thinking about the wind. Can you see the wind? You can. You can see the trees moving. You can see the leaves blowing. Can you see the wind that's moving them? Or can you just see the leaves? Okay, watch. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm breathing, right? Can you see anything coming out? No. So when you, when you have air moving, you really don't see the air. Now, we see the effects of it, especially in Winslow. Dirt in the air. We see dirt, dust, okay? And it looks really cool at sunset because it's all, you know, when there's a lot of dust in the air, it's red, and, it look, and it's really pretty. But um, you really can't see the wind at all. And there was a guy named Nicodemus. Anyone know who Nicodemus was in Sunday school? Did you ever talk to him, talk about him? Uh, he was talking to Jesus. 
And he said, and this is in Matthew, or John chapter 3, verse uh, 8, Jesus is talking to him, and, he, and Jesus, actually in verse 7, Jesus says, if you want to get into heaven, you have to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, what in the world does that mean? He says, how can I get back in my mother's womb? And in verse 8, it says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And what he's saying is, we can't see the Spirit of God, but we can feel the Spirit of God, and we can see what the Spirit of God does. And so when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he says, you got to do something. you got to have the Spirit in you. And Nicodemus is like, how in the world do I do that? And probably the most famous Bible verse in the world is John 3, 16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So, how do we get the Spirit in us? By trusting in Jesus. And when it says believe, a lot of times like, well, you know, I believe he was there, but believe is really trust him and serve him, and live for him, is what that means, all right? So when you see the wind out there blowing, instead of going, ugh, go, you know what? May the Spirit of God move like that in us. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for, <laughs> for changing weather patterns, and Lord, it uh, looks like we're right in the middle of it. But um, I just thank you that your spirit can move powerfully within us. And that's what, Lord, I ask your spirit to do with us. Just work in our lives. Direct us. Guide us. Blow us where you want us to go. For its name in Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ted. Thank you for that convicting reminder because I'm one of the ones that looks out the wind and I'm like, ah. Of course, I grew up here. You know, I was in, ran track in high school here. And uh, during our spring season, you know, is when we're the windiest. And I was in high school, like six feet tall and about 50 pounds. And so, I mean, the one guy that was like, running backwards when everybody else is running forwards depending on where I was on the track at the time. On some directions I was running really fast. <laughs> Other directions. I was like, what's that? Oh, that's Fred Harris. Good to see you this morning. I'm glad you um, are all here. Uh, I love seeing your smiley faces. Um, I don't know if you heard this or caught this. I didn't see it anywhere on Facebook, but we got a public notice out on our street again this last week. Um, but the city of Winslow was just quick uh, this week. They, they covered it up this week before even I saw it. And the only way I knew about it was Kathy Strango told me um, that somebody wanted us to know that God loves gays. I'm written in pretty pink and really nice lettering down on our street. I think we probably need to find whoever's doing this and thank them for getting our message out for us. Um, you know, we're always looking for really creative ways and spending money and time and effort and everything to let everybody know about God's love. And they're actually putting the message out for us for free without us even saying anything. Um, I do feel a little, it's a little bit unfortunate that they keep running out of paint um, because they just kind of stop with God loves gays. Uh, they also need to write in there, you know, God loves adulterers, and, and God loves thieves, and God loves liars, and God loves pedophiles, and they don't write all that. So maybe if they ever contact you, you can suggest maybe just economically or time-wise, it'd just be easier to write, God loves sinners. And that, that would get our uh, message out of what we really want everybody um, to know. Although that kind of promotes vandalism. I guess we shouldn't encourage um, vandalism. I, I don't know about you, but this last week, um, it was a little bit of a head scratcher of, you know, where exactly is America headed? 
Um, I, I'm not even talking about the presidential election, although the way that's coming down and the way some of the reports are coming in and we're just completely ignoring them, that's enough of a question. But I'm really talking about how as a state, we legalized recreational marijuana. I mean, I wasn't on the board with the argument that we have to have the marijuana as a joint as medicine, but now we've, now we've legalized recreational marijuana. And then as a town, um, we have actually taken this lifestyle that God condemns repeatedly as an abomination to him. I mean, not only does he say that repeatedly, he says, I'll wipe out whole nations because of this. And then he actually gives an example of when he actually did that with Sodom and Gomorrah. And we vote to preserve that as a good lifestyle in the public arena. And I'm looking at that and it's like, you know, where exactly are we headed? I mean, I know on the national scale, the big debate was, are we going for socialism or are we going for capitalism? Are we going for big government control or are we going for the rights of the individual? But I'm thinking if we can't get some of these littler things right, can we handle freedom as an individual? I mean, didn't our founding fathers say that our system will only work if we remain a moral culture that's based upon the Ten Commandments and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what they said. So if we systematically reject that as our foundation, how much can we handle freedom as a nation? And then I guess the other question is, if you want to look on the bigger scale of things, does it really matter? Does it really matter what happens to America? I, I, of course it matters to us. Like we're living here. Of course it matters to our children and our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. We want them to not have an absolutely crazy culture to grow up in. But in the grand cosmic scale, the grand cosmic scheme of things, does it really matter what happens to America when we take our turn systematically rejecting the gospel after we've had it for a while, when so many other nations have already done that. And they did that hundreds of years ago. I mean, I'm talking about nations in Asia and Europe and in the Middle East and in Africa. You know, right, that they already had the gospel. I mean, we talk about how there are all these unchurched nations and unreached people groups and stuff. Well, they're unreached now, but they haven't always been. I mean, India has less than 1% Christianity now, but that wasn't always true. Did you know that the Apostle Thomas, when they spread out, that's actually where he went to India? They had the gospel, and they've since rejected it. China had the gospel before the communists took over. Christianity had a huge presence in China, and they walked away from it. When communism took over, the Christianity that you see now is a resurgence. It's not like they're hearing it for the first time. It's come back. And so pretty much every nation before us or every large uh, cultural group has rejected the gospel already. We're just one among many. And they did that hundreds of years ago, and the world is still spinning. Does it really matter that we're doing it now? Here's my humble opinion. You know, every once in a while I just have to interject a Fred theory. Here's Fred theory. Someday God might be saying, what were you thinking? <laughs> okay, I'll just have to live with that then. But here's Fred theory. I think it does matter. I think it is a big deal that we're taking our turn doing that now. And it's not because we're so important. It's not because we're so central to what the rest of the world is doing. America could, could cease existing tomorrow and the world could keep going. I think the reason that it matters that we're systematically rejecting the gospel now and taking our turn um, and doing that in the public arena is because we're the uttermost parts of the earth. You know, Jesus gave his prophecy, right? The book of Acts. He said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. 
you don't get any more uttermost than we are. Geographically speaking, we are about as far away from Jerusalem, where the gospel began, as you can possibly get. All these other nations and all these cultures had their chance as the gospel spread to where the gospel came in, it impacted them for a while, they were blessed because of it for a little while, then they rejected it, and now it's our turn, and we've had almost the exact same story. We're doing almost the exact same thing. And it's a matter of, it could be that we're just towards the bottom of the list of people that have had their chance, and we're rejecting it. I mean, very soon... It just looks like God has a right to say to all the powers and principalities of the universe to say, hey, I am the just judge. He, he has a right very soon to call all the nations together and say, I waited until all of you had your chance to hear the gospel, and this is what you did with it. Welcome to Judgment Day. I'm not an alarmist. I'm, I'm not a prophet by any means, but just from what it looks like God is doing with salvation story, I can say this confidently, we sure are a whole lot closer than we've ever been before. <laughs> huh. You know, last week Lou started us in on the conversation of talking about the end times and did a great job. I appreciate that, Lou, um, by kind of giving us an overview of Luke 21. He opened up a lot of a lot of boxes and helped us to peer inside at a lot of different categories of where we're going to be heading. I want to consider that, or I want to uh, build on that conversation this morning. Um, but before we get into the nitty gritties, I'm not going to pick apart Luke 21 this morning. I really want to look instead at, does this kind of talk really matter? I mean, I, we all know Jesus is going to win. Shouldn't that be sufficient? Why, why do we care about a study of the end times? Why should we care about the nitty gritties? Why should we even look at how it looks like it's going to fall into place? Does it really matter? I mean, after all, in the movies, uh, right about the time there's like an alien invasion or an asteroid's coming to Earth, they always show this one guy. I mean, he has a different face, but he's the same guy. He's a loony, right? And he's wild-eyed, he's, he's scruffy-looking, he's usually holding a cardboard sign, and he's going around screaming, the end is near, the end is near. I mean, crazy people worry about that stuff. Shouldn't it be more responsible just to kind of be more level-headed and pay attention to what's right in front of us? You know, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it and just not worry about anything else. Now, I'm just going to look for the joy of the Lord in my situation today. I'm going to be a good neighbor. I'm going to have a good family. I'm going to be prosperous in my career. I'm just going to enjoy Jesus whenever he comes. Why do I have to worry about anything past that? Why do I think about this? Does it matter? Once again, this isn't Fred theory uh, this time, uh, but I am going to say, yeah, it does. I don't, I don't think this is Fred theory. I think this is Bible. Yeah, it does. It does matter. And if you're a note taker, here's three different reasons why it matters. Here's number one. We're going to spend the majority of our time on number one, and then we're going to hit number two and number three really fast. So if you're like looking at your watch, it's like, wow, we're still on number one. And it's like, <laughs> don't worry, because we're going to spend, I know we're going to spend the mo most of our time on number one. And if you're a note taker, here's why you should care about the end times, why we should study it, why we should think about it, why we should talk about it. Number one, end times is one of the main topics of Scripture. You can't read God's message that he wants you to know and not think about the end times because you would be ignoring one of the main things that God wants to talk about. John MacArthur, he says that roughly 20% of Scripture is dedicated to the topic of the end times. I would argue that if you add in there typology um, and foreshadowings that it's actually a much greater percentage than 20%. Now, I do have to digress a little bit. I just threw a big $5 word at you that you can use to impress your friends at parties. What do we mean when we say typology? A type of something. Well, that's what Jesus was referring to when he said all of the scripture is actually about me. Uh, I'm reading the book of Jonah 
And he got swallowed by a big fish, and he went to go talk to a bunch of Ninevites. I don't remember seeing Jesus mentioned anywhere in the book of Jonah. I don't remember Jesus mentioned anywhere in the book of Esther. Well, the way that Jesus can say everything in the Bible is actually talking about him as he's referring to typology. For example, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah gives all these prophecies about how God is going to raise up the ruler David to do this and accomplish that and to bring all this peace and prosperity to the people of Israel. And we're like reading Jeremiah. It's like, well, I thought David had already been dead for like hundreds of years by this point. He had been. So why was God telling Jeremiah that I'm going to raise up David if he had already been dead for hundreds of years? Was God teaching reincarnation? No, he was teaching typology. David is a type. He's a foreshadowing of who God was going to raise up to be this kind of ruler, to do this or that for Israel. He was going to be like David in all these different ways. David was Israel's greatest king who defeated all of Israel's enemies. Another David was coming that would do that. David was a king, but he kept acting like a priest because he was so adamant about bringing people into the worship of God. There's not going to be another king who's going to rise up and do that. There's another king that is going to be a, a king of peace. He's going to be so powerful that he was going to bring peace and prosperity to his people. Another king was going to rise up, and he was going to be able to do that. It's a type. David was a type. He was a foreshadowing of who Jesus was going to be. And if we start looking at scriptures, keeping in mind typology, which is looking at one scripture and seeing a reference to something completely different that's going to happen in the future, oh my goodness, we see end times everywhere. If you are still taking notes, I got a lot for you this morning. Um, just as kind of a sampling. I didn't try to give you um, uh, thorough. I mean, that would take like a whole year. Um, but just a sampling of some of the different types that we can clearly see in the Old Testament and the New Testament pointing to what we have to look forward to. And interestingly enough, the very first one comes about in Genesis chapter 3. Here's the first one. In the law, um, the law I mean Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In Bible talk, once upon a time, that was all one scroll. We split it into five different books, but they had it at the beginning as one scroll that Moses wrote. And other people might have added their little editorials because the end of it, Moses dies. And so somebody wrote the ending for him. We have it in five different books because one scroll of the law would be like, <laughs> it'd just be huge. And it's like, you'd have to be buff and chiseled to go to church and carry your Bible with you. And so what they did is they cut it into uh, five different scrolls just for practicality's sake. And so in the law, at the very beginning, right in the story of the fall and God's prophecy after that, we actually see a prophecy about the fall of the Antichrist. Have you heard this before? Let's turn there. Three, chapter 3, verse 15. You'll recognize this verse. It's a common one. We use it a lot, but there might be a part that you kind of overlook. This is um, Eve ate the fruit. She gave it to Adam. They're all blaming each other. And... Uh, Everybody blames the snake. And so this is what God tells the snake, who we know is basically possessed by Satan. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, the part that gets all the press is that last part. Um, he, referring to Jesus, shall bruise your head you're going to bruise his heel. And of course, we see in that the crucifixion. Um, Satan was able to bruise Jesus' heel. I mean, he got him crucified by evil men. He got him whipped and beaten and mocked and made as a public display to where it looks like the whole world turns against him. And it looks like Jesus lost. But whereas Jesus only got his heel bruised, Jesus bruises that serpent's head. I mean, he crushes him because he didn't stay dead. 
I mean, with the crucifixion, he actually was paying for our sin. And then he resurrects from the dead, uh, defeating death, so that we have a hope of living with Jesus forever. And he um, basically earned the right to be the king of his kingdom that's going to last forever. And so we get that. I mean, we hear that sermon. We hear the, that Bible lesson. Here's the part that doesn't get as much press. And Jesus said, or God said at the beginning, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So that's Eve and the snake. Between your offspring, that we see as Jesus, or I mean, uh, between your offspring and her offspring. Her offspring we see as Jesus, but also between your offspring and Jesus. Wait a minute. Who is Satan's offspring? Who is Satan's kid? Now, despite what we might think about Hitler or Stalin or that little kid that would always steal your lunch money in elementary school, they were not the child of Satan that it is referring to here. There are only two people in the whole Bible that talk about being possessed by Satan himself. And out of those two, only one is described as being empowered with all of Satan's power and having all of Satan's words put in his mouth and being fully possessed by Satan himself. The first one that didn't receive all of Satan's power, but he was fully possessed, was Judas. And we see what happened with him. The second one is the Antichrist. And judging by the fact that we see what happened with Judas when he went up against the offspring of the woman, we have a pretty good idea already what's going to happen to the Antichrist when he does the same thing. And this is important to hang on to because Revelation tells us it's going to look like the Antichrist wins. I don't know if you feel that today. It's where it just looks like evil is winning. And what can you do? I, we feel so weak. We feel so helpless. How can we turn this around? And it's like right is getting crushed and evil is like running rampant in the streets. Doesn't it look like the bad guy is winning? Well, it's really going to look like in the future. It's, but he's only bruising Jesus' heel. Someday, don't forget the rest of it, Jesus is going to crush Satan's head. His offspring included. And we see that, a type of that, a foreshadowing of that, a prophecy of that, all the way back in the book of Genesis. Here's another one. While we're talking about the law, the day of God's wrath is illustrated by Noah's flood. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verses 3 through 7. This is found on page 1019 if you're following along in a foyer Bible. Um, if you got your own Bible, you can see how close I am to the back. This is like way towards the back. Second Peter, and it's a small book. Don't flip too fast. Starting with verse 3 of chapter 3. Scoffers, in the last part of the verse, scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? Talking about Jesus' return. For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they, these scoffers, deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished but by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. In Noah's flood, what happened is God took everything and he destroyed it in one shot by a flood of water. And Peter's making a connection here of he's going to do this again. He's going to destroy everything again. But this time, he's going to do it with a flood of fire. The first time, God preserved everybody who believed in him um, putting, by putting them on a boat that was covered in pitch. And the Hebrew word there even says that boat was atoned. 
It was covered, is what atonement means. It was covered with pitch and the new fire, or the new flood that's coming by fire. Anybody who believes in God, anybody who puts their faith in following his ways, he's going to put them on a new ark. And this time, this new ark is Jesus. And now we're not covered with tar. Now we're not atoned by tar. Now we're covered by his blood. So even with the story of Noah, that's not history, that just history. It's also prophecy of don't get too attached to everything that you see. I mean, we get bent out of shape when people steal from us and they oppress us. But don't worry about it because this that you see isn't going to last. This is temporary. Everything's going to be destroyed. You want to survive that? Get on the ark. Be covered by Jesus' blood. Come before him and say, I am so sorry for my sins. Please rescue me. And the wrath that came before that's coming again, you can be saved from it. While everything else is destroyed around you, you yourself will be saved. And go into Jesus' recreation and his restoration of this world just like he did it after Noah. He's going to do it again. Instead, it's going to be better than you've ever seen it before. And we learn about that all the way back in the book of Genesis. Here's the next one while we're talking about the law. The exile and the return is foretold in, that's foretold in Deuteronomy. It actually points to the millennial kingdom. Deuteronomy? That's in Deuteronomy. Can anything interesting come out of Deuteronomy? Oh, man, for those of you that missed Wednesday night, you just really missed out. We were turning the pages. It's like, oh, my word. Look at everything that God packed into here. No wonder Jesus quoted this book so often. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 10. Why do I say it's actually a prophecy of the millennial kingdom? Uh, Deuteronomy is the fifth foot book in your Bible, and I'm actually on page 172 if you're using a foyer Bible. When all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I've set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today, with all your heart, with all your soul. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. And he will gather you again from all the people where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you. And from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possess, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, that you may live. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies, on your foes and the enemies who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your cattle, and the fruit of your ground. For the Lord God will again take delight in prospering you as he took delight in your fathers when you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So to keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in the book of the law, when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul. Now, this is coming about in context. It's coming about, God says in these chapters, if you would only obey me, I'm going to give you all these blessings. But if you disobey me, I'm going to give you all these curses that are going to end in you going into exile. Now, that's the bad news. They're going to go off into exile, and as a result of the exile, they're going to be scattered all over the world. But here's the good news. God says, but while you're in exile, I'm going to grab you, and I'm going to take you. And actually, our, our version kind of, our translation kind of doesn't bring this out much, but he, that word outcasts is actually singular. He's going to hunt down individuals. I mean, they're, they're in the middle of the, 
jungles of Africa, he's going to find them. He's going to hunt down individuals and he's going to bring them back. He's finally going to circumcise their hearts to where finally they're going to love him with all of their heart, all of their soul, all of their strength, and they are going to obey his law completely. And then he's going to bring them back into their country to where he's going to prosper them in a way they've never prospered before. Now, we saw the first part of this happen, right? I mean, God was under no delusion that they were ever going to be able to keep his law. So sure enough, just as soon as he starts ritually blessing them in the promised land, they immediately forget about them. They start worshiping the gods of other nations. They get so evil that God's like, all right, you are so out of here. I said I was going to do this. So off into exile you go into Babylon. Seventy years later, he brings them back. But when they came back, were their hearts circumcised? Were they loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, strength? Were they obeying him completely? No, on Sunday nights we went through this. Ezra, Nehemiah, with just one generation, they totally forgot about the temple. They were intermarrying with the pagan people again. They are starting to do all this trade with all these pagans again. They weren't worshiping idols. But they sure weren't worshiping God either. And you build 400 years of generations onto that generation, all of a sudden they're actually willing to kill the Son of God himself because he's messing with their system. So God's like, all right, you didn't do it. You didn't do it right. You're going into exile again, just like I said I would do to you whenever you act like this. And so all of a sudden now come the Romans. And once again... The Jews are scattered all over the world. This time, the exile doesn't go for 70 years. This time, the exile's going for 2,000 years. 1948, God starts bringing them back. Did it work this time? Now their lives, their hearts are circumcised. Now they're loving God with all of their heart, mind, soul, strength. Now they're obeying his law completely. No, they write a constitution that could have easily been a national constitution for an atheistic nation. They leave God out completely. They, they uh, pursue national security. They pursue technology. They pursue warfare. They pursue becoming one of the biggest intelligence agencies in the world. They pursue agriculture. But their hearts aren't circumcised. So you read Zechariah, what do we see? They're going to go into exile again. At the end, half their city is going to be destroyed. Uh, the others of them are going to be scattered again. And how are they going to come back this time? Nothing short of Jesus Christ himself coming, pouring out his Holy Spirit on them. And finally, their hearts are circumcised. Finally, they learn how to love him with all their heart, mind, soul, strength. Finally, they learn how to obey him. And he brings them into what Deuteronomy is describing. And you're like, well, that's not the millennial kingdom. That's heaven, right? Well, did you notice he says, I'm going to bless the fruit of your womb? In heaven, women, praise God. You can praise God with me. You don't have to ever go through labor again. Right? But they will in the millennial kingdom. This prosperity that Jesus is going to give them that they never experienced before because finally they were obeying him completely. It's talking about this existence of this millennial kingdom, this earthly existence. God promised all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 10. The Bible's just filled, pointing to the end times. Here we're not going to talk at great length about these because I'm out of time. I knew I was going to be out of time, so I didn't even give you the references. But here in, you see in books of history, you see that Joshua and the conquest of Canaan foreshadowed Jesus bringing believers into heaven. Actually, we're in a little bit of the conquest now. We're like, we don't own the promised land yet, but we're trying to spread our influence. So it's a little bit of our existence now, but ultimately it's Jesus bringing us into the promised land. Uh, but then you see the prophecy regarding David's son is actually a promise of Jesus and his reign over Israel at the end of all things. And we kind of already talked about how David was a, David's son was a foreshadowing of Jesus. Now here's the next one. 
The peace and prosperity of Solomon's kingdom foreshadowed the peace and prosperity of Jesus' kingdom at the end. Um, David was a foreshadowing of Jesus, so was Solomon. Solomon's name actually means peace, so he was a king of peace. And when God was prophesying to David about Jesus, he said, your son is going to build for me a temple. Solomon built the temple. Your son is going to bring peace. Solomon's kingdom was the reign of peace. It was the golden era in Jewish theology. It was all pointing to Jesus. And then you have the next section, the prophets. And the prophets, only a third of them, or in the prophets, only a third of prophecies were fulfilled by Jesus' first coming. The remaining two-thirds that we find await his second coming. And these usually aren't just types and foreshadowing. This is the prophecy actually saying this is what's going to happen at the end. Two-thirds of them have not been fulfilled yet, meaning it's pointing towards the end times. Two-thirds of the prophets are telling us you need to pay attention to the end times. What does that tell God when we say, yeah, but we don't want to think about that. We don't care about that. We just care about the fact that Jesus is coming. That's all we worry about. God's like, well... Why did I write all this stuff down? I sure used up a lot of ink. <laughs> Here's more. In the New Testament, one of Jesus' longest sermons, he has one week of his life left. And his sermon is the one that we're reading, st starting to study right now, is one of the longest sermons in his last week. And what is it all about? The end times. Every New Testament writer describes some aspect of the end times. The book of Revelation was primarily written to address the end times and Jesus' role in them. Obviously, God cares that we think about, talk about, study the end times because he spent a very long time writing about it. He kept bringing it up. We are sinning if we keep ignoring what God has to say because we just don't care. There's a reason why he wants us to know. Why else should we care? The end times is one of the main topics of Scripture, but number two, study of the end times encourages us by focusing our eyes on the happy ending. Look with me in Luke chapter 21. This is that long sermon I was talking about that Jesus teaches the last week of his life what he wants to leave his disciples with. And towards the end of the sermon, after he talks about all these scary things that are coming before the end, this is what he says in verse 34. Watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But you, you stay awake at all times praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of watching the news. I'm tired of listening to it. I'm tired of being reminded how screwed up and evil we really are as a culture. And especially me, because I'm not a post-millennialist, now believes that things are just going to keep getting better and better and better and better until Jesus comes? I don't see that. And, and we'll get into this, but I'm not even a pre-tribber that thinks that God is going to rescue us from everything before it gets really bad. Um, so you look at me and the way I interpret this stuff, I think it's just going to get a whole lot worse. And if I just look at that, that, oh man, it's going to get a whole lot worse from here. And I look at how bad things are now. And I don't pay attention to what God says about the ending. What is going to be my temptation? Forget this, right? Man, this is horrible. And you're telling me it's going to get worse? Tell you what, let's just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Why bother standing up for what's right when it looks like we're the only ones and nobody's going to listen to us? Why bother sharing this gospel if the world is going to soundly reject it? Why bother try to be faithful when all we get from it is a bunch of persecution? Forget this. 
past the substances that I can just pour down my gullet so I can forget and ignore it. Give me another channel on Netflix so that I can just binge on some show and ignore real life. I just want to escape. Don't, don't worry me with all that stuff. I don't even want to think about all that stuff. Forget it. If it's just going to be a depressing message, I'm not going to think about it. And Jesus said in these verses, don't you be like that. Yes, the, the world is never going to produce for us the town of Mayberry. That's depicted in Norman Rockwell paintings, right? We, we get that. It's just bad. And the way I read it, it's going to get worse. But don't let that dishearten you. Jesus is saying here, you know the reason I tell you all this stuff isn't so you can be overwhelmed by all that stuff. It's not so you can be terrified and hide under your couch. I'm telling this to you so that you don't fall into the trap of thinking the world is spinning out of control and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm telling this to you ahead of time so that when it comes, you can see to yourself, oh, Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. This must be all part of a plan. This must be headed a particular kind of direction. And oh, I look at the end of the story, Jesus is going to win. He's coming back. He's going to set everything right. He's going to destroy all the forces of evil. And get this, because he says it a lot. I am going to reward every single faithful act that my people do during all this tumultuous time. Hang on to that. End times gives you this perspective to where you don't have to be overwhelmed and despairing. You can say, you know what? This is all part of it. I get it. God is ordering this. Jesus is breaking the seals. And we're going to win. Amen. Here's the last one. Study the end times should keep us sharing the gospel. The way I read it, it's going to be bad for Christians but it's going to be even worse for them. Why? Because we're going to have our economies collapse. We're going to have all these natural disasters. We're going to experience all these wars and all these famines and all these diseases and pestilences and earthquakes and all that stuff. But we hang on because we're like, but we know what this is accomplishing. We know where this is bringing us. We know what's going to happen. All they have is what they see right in front of, us, right in front of them. And all this stuff starts coming down on them. They are completely hopeless the best they have is their political leaders getting into power and them keeping in power no matter what it takes. That's the only hope they have, and that's no hope at all. And their hopelessness is going to go for eternity. Look at the foot in front of your bulletin. I love this picture that Kathy Strango found. Jack's first thing that he noticed at the front of his bulletin when he looked at that picture is, Jesus' hair is white. <laughs> It's like, oh yeah, but don't miss that blazing look in his eyes. Don't miss the fact that his sword is drawn. Don't miss the fact that his robe is dipped in blood. Jesus is coming back, and he's hacked. He came the first time as a little meek and mild lamb to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. The second time, he's coming in as a uh, riding on his horse as a conqueror, and he's taken. He's, he's demolishing all the forces that ever set themselves up against him and had the arrogance to think that they can win. And then I want you to pick out one of the faces in the crowd behind him riding in on his horse and know, from the way I see it, that's you. You're riding in with him. You don't have to fight. We're all dressed in white. That tells me that we're not really planning on getting very dirty. Because Jesus, the way he wins a war is he speaks one thing, and then pfft, all the armies are dead. You can read how they die in the book of Zechariah. It start, starts describing in gory detail what it looks like when Jesus wins. It, it's nasty. But we've got to be careful how we view that now. What we've got to guard our little skeevy hearts against is, yeah, <laughs> take that. 
and just get this spirit of revenge of, oh, you think you're so bad now, but hey, someday I'm riding in behind Jesus and you're going to get yours. Now hold on. That is true. But that wasn't Jesus' attitude when he was here. In this era that we're in right now, the era that we're in right now is the era of grace. Where our mentality has got to be, God, I know what's coming. I know who's going to win. I know what's going to happen to all those people that set themselves against you. Please, Jesus, while you're still giving us time, help us, use us to throw out the lifeline to save one more. You haven't come today. Please, help us to throw out a lifeline to rescue just one more. Oh, God, what a trophy it would be if you only you could rescue Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, the spray painters of our streets, the ones stuffing the ballot boxes and thinking they're getting away with it. God, rescue one more. You want to really show your power? Wouldn't it be cool if you turn this evil person who hates you into a whole new creation who loves you and actually use them as part of reigning over your kingdom forever and ever? Jesus, only you can do something like that. Please pull that off while we still have time. Keeping in mind the end times keeps in the forefront of our mind. These people that were praying for their salvation, they do not have an unlimited amount of time. This is a limited time offer we're talking about. Jesus is going to come back and he is going to call everybody into account. Let's not be filled with vengeance over that. Let's use that to drive us to keep on with our gospel message that they desperately need to hear. Study the end times. It's important. This is an obedience issue here. So I'm not going to be here next week. We got a missionary coming. We, uh, I'm going to Mexico, being a missionary myself with a mission team. Some of us that are I'm going out, and we're going to pray for them in here in just a moment. Um, by the way, uh, Ted, anybody over in the fellowship hall that's going on the mission team, can you bring them over right now? We want to pray for you guys. I'm saying that to the camera. Um, so uh, we're going to be gone next week. We're going to be building a, a house and be praying for us. Um, but when we come back, um, we're going to be talking about the end times. Please come. Please don't stay home. Say, I don't like talking about that stuff. I don't want to think about that stuff. We need to know about that stuff. There's a reason why God spent so much time talking about it. And hopefully it'll be a time not just interesting, you know, nothing else. Man, this stuff is stinking interesting. Um, but it'll be a time of encouragement and time of empowerment to where we can be emboldened to be who God's called us to be in a world that looks like it's just going nuts. To pray for you, if I can call everybody who is going on the mission trip, if you can come to the front. Oh, I see that door opening. That means Ted's on his way. Come on down. If you can stand to your feet. Um, if I can have, if you are one of our deacons, if you can come down and just kind of help gather around these guys. Clump up, clump up together, clump up together. And uh, those of you, you can just pray towards us. Um, some of you, if you're deacons or church leaders, if you can uh, gather around and pray of course, we're going to be praying for safety, praying for effectiveness. We want to do far more than just build a home. Um, we want to make an impact on this family that might not be a Christian family. We don't know that yet. Um, but we want them to see Jesus in a very real way. Um, Ted, you're kind of our team leader um, for this. Do you want to lead us in prayer? Father, what an opportunity you are giving us to uh, 
make a huge impact in the lives, the daily lives of a family in, uh, in Mexico. But Father, I pray that you give us the power and the ability to make an impact for eternity mm. in this family's life, Lord. Father, as we go, I do pray for protection. I pray for uh, calmness at the border. Um, just we can get across quickly. And Lord, I pray for um, the mother that we're going to build a house for and the two children, Lord. I ask you to bless them. Use us for that blessing. And Father, I do pray for uh, us to be a shining example of what it means to be a Christian. Father, we just thank you and I praise you for uh, all those that signed up to go this year. And I'm, I thank you for those that are going to be praying for us as we're gone. Lord, just um, help us to make an impact. For its name in Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 You can go back to your seats. You stay standing. If you have something that you want prayer for, if you want to make a decision, say, you know what, I want to get on that ark. I want to be covered by Jesus' blood. I want to be saved from what's coming. Um, talk to one of us. And we would love to share the gospel with you. We'd love to pray with you. If you're already a Christian, you just got something weighing on you. Um, share it. Uh, let us pray for you. Let us bear that burden with you. Um, what decision do you need to make? Uh, you decide. There's going to be prayer counselors up here. I'll be at the back uh, shaking hands or, or fist bumping or whatever you want to do. Um, and uh, we'll close with a song.